Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us to get a briefing with regard to how the state is responding to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. We are going to have Commissioner Bloomstead talk a little bit later today, so very pleased to have you. Thank you for being here back again. But we got some other things first we want to hit upon. Uh, first of all, as always, want to remind people about our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy. Again, want people to make sure they're not taking unnecessary steps or uh, unnecessary trips outside the household. So that's rule number one. Still continue to stay home as much as possible. Number two, we want you to work. Work from home if you can. If you're going to be in the social or if you're going to be in the workplace, socially distance. Again, the six foot rule, ten person rule, all those sort of things. Carpooling only with household members or if you're going to carpool with other people, only two people, both wearing masks. Those are kind of the, some of the common sense things we can do to slow the spread of virus. When we think about the workplace, uh, bring your own lunch, don't share lunch, that kind of thing. So all good things you can do to be able to help slow the spread of virus in the workplace. So continue to keep that in mind. And then, of course, uh, we also want you to shop. Shop once a week. Don't bring the entire family. Be efficient. Get in, get out. So again, limit the exposure that you have there by going out shopping. Number four, help children. Keep them at home to play, avoid group sports, avoid playgrounds. Help seniors, number five. Run errands for them, maybe go grocery shopping for them so that they can stay home and again, avoid those crowds. And number six, of course, is exercise daily in an appropriate socially distanced way or exercise at home. Those are all six rules to keep Nebraska healthy. I want to remind people of that every time we get started. Uh, also want to remind people that we've got uh, new DHMs that are uh, going to be going in place starting May 11th. So again, we've covered this map before. So if you look the dark blue, these are the 59 counties that the DHM went effective this week, May 4th. Uh, the light blue is the May 11th. We'll be getting those DHMs actually published out tomorrow, but just a reminder that that's coming up for May 11th. Hospital data. Again, I want to remind people that the, the whole reason we do the social distancing all the restrictions we put in place for these DHMs and everything is about making sure that we flatten the curve. And by flatten it means that you don't have the big peak of all the people going to the hospital at once, that you flatten it down, and that you preserve the healthcare system. And we've been successful at doing that here in Nebraska. So if you look right now, we've got 48% of our hospital beds available, 44% of our ICU beds available, and 77% of our ventilators available. Lots of capacity in the healthcare system. We've been successful in flattening that curve so that we do not overwhelm the healthcare system. And that is our North Star, that's our guiding principle for how we drive all these decisions, is making sure we're paying attention to the healthcare system so that everybody who needs that hospital bed, that intensive care unit bed, or that ventilator has access to one. And we've been able to manage it even in our hotspots, places like Grand Island. We've been able to work with CHI St. Francis to be able to make sure that we move patients when we had to to create capacity there, and now that system is really pretty much stable right now. So uh, we've been successful. Um, we talked last year, uh, last or yesterday about aggregate numbers. So I want to just take a step back with regard to some of these aggregate numbers. First of all, we at the state are only going to publish aggregate numbers for things like long-term care facilities or food processing and things like that. Local health departments uh, have the option to decide how they're going to present that data, but what we recommend, because we got a question about this, or we were talking about this yesterday, is for our local health departments to only present that data if it has been verified and you've gotten permission from that facility. Because what we found is some people will go and say they work for a facility and they've tested positive when they don't work for that facility. Some people may be tested positive and they won't tell you you work for that facility. The, the lab testing stuff doesn't come back with those employment numbers. That's something that, we, that the local public health department has to ask. And really, it's important to not only ask that, but verify it, that it's actually true, because we have had people who aren't actually telling the truth with regard to what their place of employment is. So we do have aggregate data that we are uh, you know, tracking at the state, but that's the only way we're going to present it is the aggregate. So with regard to those long-term care facilities, we have 267 residents that have tested positive. We have 188 staff that have tested positive and 57 fatalities in those long-term care facilities. So again, you can see that 57, I think we're up to 86 total. 86, 
Yeah, total uh, casualties, total deaths in the state of Nebraska. So over half of those are coming from our long-term care facilities. And then uh, with regard to food processing, we have 1,005 people in those food processing facilities that have tested positive, and that's out of what, 67, 77, something like that, over 6,000 total cases. Uh, 6,771. 6,771, so off by six. Thank you, Dr. Anto. So, uh, but again, so uh, about a sixth, roughly, of the, the overall cases are testing from those food processing plants. So we wanted to get that out there because we've been asked questions about that. Uh, also want to remind people about testnebraska.com. We uh, have been testing now for three full days. We're on our fourth day in Omaha and Grand Island. Uh, yesterday, we completed 526 tests. We have 129,462 people that have signed up for, or individuals that have signed up and done over 165,000 assessments. So again, uh, last Sunday, we sent out a bunch of emails for people to update their assessment. If you develop symptoms, you should update your assessment because uh, symptoms can develop quickly. And we'd also been asked questions yesterday about uh, people getting uh, the notification that they're eligible for being testing. So first of all, if you are somebody who says you've got symptoms, or uh, so if you answer yes, I've got symptoms, you will get scheduled. If you answer no, I don't have symptoms, but you also answer I am a healthcare worker, uh, first responder, or in one of our food processing facilities, meat processing facilities, you will get scheduled. Now, in the schedule, the sites we have right now are Grand Island, Omaha, so if you are someplace else, you would have to travel to that, or you can wait till there's a local testing site that's gonna be closer and more convenient for you. You can certainly wait for that um, if you're one of those healthcare workers or so forth. Um, but that's out there available. We also had a question yesterday about a healthcare worker who did not get scheduled. And so we dug into that. Uh, actually, it was actually two days ago that that feature actually got turned on so that you know, from the last two days, if you said you're a healthcare worker, then you would get uh, scheduled. So I think that person probably just signed up beforehand before that feature had been turned on. So but that feature is now turned on within the software so that you know, if you identify as a healthcare worker, you will get scheduled. So we're expecting that's gonna work going forward. Uh, so that's kind of the status with regard to testnebraska.com. We're also very excited to be able to announce our third testing site, which will be here in Lincoln at the Lancaster Event Center starting tomorrow at 8 a.m., 8 to 6, Friday and Sunday, sorry, Friday and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, so we are excited to roll out our third testing site that we've got here in the state of Nebraska. So we're excited to get that out and running right now, too. So great, great stuff going on here with regard to Test Nebraska. We encourage people to sign up, testnebraska.com. If you know somebody who would be more comfortable filling that out in Spanish, you can go to testnebraska.com slash es. That will give you the Spanish language version. Uh, again, a great way for us to be able to understand what's going on in the state, get that assessment done. This is how we're going to schedule people to get testing. It will be kept completely confidential. It is just for use in this testing program. It's an encrypted database. It will not be sold to anybody. It will not be given to law enforcement, nothing like that. This is, again, something that will help us do the assessment and schedule people to get tested. It's one way that every Nebraskan can participate in the fight against the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska by participating in that. So please sign up. Ask five of your friends to sign up. You can do the Test Nebraska Challenge, hashtag Test Nebraska Challenge, to be able to get those other folks to sign up. This is going to be important for us to be able to really make sure we're testing, finding those people that are positive, getting them to isolate, finding the people they've been in contact with, asking them to quarantine so we can slow the spread of virus here in our state. This is standard practice for how you address pandemics like this and epidemics to be able to really focus on the people who are infected and keeping them isolated so that you can start losing restrictions on everybody else. So this is key strategy for us on how we're going to be doing all this going forward. So please sign up for testnebraska.com. Oh, also, uh, there was a question about the domain for the assessments. The domain for the assessments is qemailserver.com. Q is in the letter, letter Q, emailserver.com. We received some questions about the domain name. That's it for the domain name for the assessments. Okay, next. It is, I've, we've talked about, the, this is a busy week for appreciation. We've talked about appreciation for nurses who are obviously on the front line of fighting this pandemic. We talked about our correctional officers and our 
correctional professionals and our correctional nurses. nurses. We mentioned them yesterday. Uh, and it is also Teachers Appreciation Week. And this is also particularly uh, important right now with regard to this pandemic because, as we know, our schools have been operating without students for the better part of two months now. And our teachers are, again, playing a frontline role here, a critical, necessary, important role with regard to how we continue to get kids educated even without them not being in the classroom. They've had to be flexible. They've had to be creative. They've worked long hours. Uh, they've been having to work on other things, too, like how do you make sure those kids who are food insecure are able to get those meals even if they're not coming into school. So educators, our administrators, everybody's doing a really great job. Today we're highlighting Teacher Appreciation Week, so I want to say thank you to all those teachers out there, whether you're in a public school, a private school, a parochial school, if you're a homeschooler, all of our teachers have been working very, very hard to educate our kids and instill those great values into them, and we just want to say thank you for all your great work. And as part of that, I am signing this proclamation, proclaiming it Teacher Appreciation Week in Nebraska. So here's to all those teachers. Thank you very much. Appreciate all your great work. And along that line, I'm going to bring up Matt Bloomson, our Commissioner for Education. He, is, uh, he and I have actually been working together on a number of different things uh, from the beginning of this pandemic to be able to address it. He's got some important announcements that he's going to be making with regard to how he's thinking about this summer and next fall. Uh, and Commissioner, I'll ask you to go ahead and take the proclamation as well as the uh, to, to back to the office and, and show folks about our Teacher Appreciation Week. And with that, I'm going to go have you and come up and say a few words. Well, thank you very much, Governor. And I, you know, one of the things we don't haven't had yet is a Governor Appreciation Day. So, so thank you for uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and and just to kind of reiterate the importance of teachers and what teachers have done all over the state, really all over the nation. And and we're really uh, always. Uh, proud of the teachers across Nebraska and really in this moment it's, it's been a remarkable a remarkable thing. I did have a, a chance to actually create a video and send it to the National uh, uh, Teachers of the Year efforts and all of our state teachers of the year and so Megan Helberg is Nebraska's Teacher of the Year and it's an unfortunate thing because normally they get to travel and convene and do uh, really unique things but uh, our teachers of the year are really critical for us and, and part of that celebration as well. And so I just highlight, actually, we're opening up the teacher of the year uh, nomination form on the Department of Education's website. Uh, folks can go there and be able to access that information. And uh, I suspect we'll have a lot of great applications this year for all of the things that, that teachers have been doing. And I would be remiss also not to kind of think of this in this moment where, where we're seeing many teachers retiring this year. And it's kind of that unfortunate thing. We've talked so much about the class of 20. 20 and the, the special need to recognize them, but our teachers that are retiring this year, it's a really you know, probably a difficult time for them to be leaving the career that they've dedicated much of their lives to. And uh, I just want to thank all of them as well in this Teacher Appreciation Week. So thank you, Governor. I'll take this back to the office and uh, we'll share that. We'll probably share that on our social media too. So thanks a lot for that. I really want to spend the bulk of my time on talking about how we begin to uh, think about our return to school protocols and how we begin to move forward as a, as a state education system and, and work ultimately together. And so I'm really announcing today our uh, Launch Nebraska effort. And it's, so it's www.launchne.com. And you can go there and start to see a, a whole set of protocols and a whole set of examples of how we're going to move forward as a state in our planning for what the summer and fall uh, can be to begin to realize some, some of that person-to-person -person contact. And we really have this chance to be able to use summer in Nebraska and learn about what are the best procedures and policies and practices that might take place in our buildings all over the state of Nebraska with all of our, with our teachers and our students and our, our families to think about what those protocols could be. And so underneath that site, it actually starts to describe several different things, key areas, leadership and planning, and really around leadership and planning, what are governance and our operations and how we're going to use technology in this moment in time to really fill in gaps that we're, that we might be experiencing in, in learning opportunities and really think about the conditions for learning, so the wellness and the well-being that, that has to take place at a facility level um, and also has to take place in just monitoring and watching the, the conditions of public health around us and how we're going to actually do that work together with our local health officials, our state officials, and make sure that we have some protocols that are really solid for, for local decision makers to make decisions about how they best manage the, in this circumstance. But we also want to talk about the conditions for learning. 
um, really being thoughtful um, uh, about how that comes together and how our ultimately our continuity of learning plans will come together. So if we are disrupted in any type of way, how we're using technology and how we're using best practices ultimately in, in, that, in that various setting. And then finally, we have on this particular site some of the professional learning and resources that we're beginning to develop. In fact, starting I think as soon as next week, we're, we're moving forward with, with webinar series on how teachers can really be effective in the online learning environment and how they can deal with a lot of different topics, including social emotional learning and how we can build those resources collectively. It's really been unique as I look across the state, the importance of the relationship between teachers and families and parents and the opportunity to engage with their students in different ways. And so there's a ton of uh, opportunity for us to think differently about the innovations that may take place in this, in this moment in time. We really do want to be able to start thinking about summer learning. You know, we're not yet at a point where we can at definitively say it's going to be safe on this date or that date, but as we get closer to that, I want school officials thinking about what they may need. I've had plenty of folks reach out and say, hey, look, we have students with special needs that may need additional uh, 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 contact during the, the summertime, and how do we start to think about safe ways to do that and engage in that? I was really pleased to see it, and I think I actually saw it on the front page of the World Herald today about just how a, a before and after school programs, thinking about being able to engage safely with students across the state. I think we're gonna, as we kind of get past May and into the summer, we're really gonna have to start getting creative on how we make those contacts come together and how they're going to work ultimately. And so this website with launchnebraska. Or excuse me, launchne.com uh, gives us a chance to uh, start to have conversations in our educational leadership. I'll have leaders from all over the state engaging with me, both in the education field and the, certainly the public health field, to talk about what really works and put resources there that are going to help guide local decision makers on their best approaches to, to really reinventing that, that space for what we're going to face as, uh, as a state. And so it's been, I think it's remarkable what teachers have done in, in this time frame. It's remarkable what administrators have done. It's remarkable what communities have thought about to try to fill the gaps that might persist. And we're going to have to continue to do that work. And I think we can do that well and best collectively. So, so thanks for the opportunity to be here, Governor, and thanks for the chance to uh, continue to the work with you. So thanks. Great, thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, and I'm, don't go too far away, because I'm sure there might be other questions, right? Okay, so yeah, don't run away, don't run away yet. Uh, a couple other things I realized I probably should have mentioned. One is with regard to the DHMs that are gonna be coming effective May 11th, those will look like the ones for May 4th. So just so we're clear, those are just kind of delayed by that extra week. Uh, also, testnebraska.com, I wanna remind people again, there is no charge for taking that test at nebraska.com. Among all the other things that you know, safe, secure data, only going to be used for testing. There's no charge for that. And again, nobody's going to be a turned away care either because of an inability to pay. So I want to make that um, clear as well. And then let's go ahead. Let me see if there's anything else I'm supposed to be saying here. Oh, of course, uh, English briefings, 2 o'clock tomorrow on Friday. We will continue those next week, 2 o'clock Central Time. Uh, Spanish language briefings tonight at uh, 5 p.m. And then I'll be on NET tonight from 8.30 to 9.30. And then again, the same schedule for next week as well with regard to our 2 p.m. English briefings, 2 p.m., or sorry, 5 p.m. Spanish language briefings on Tuesday and Thursday. Okay, so we got a number of questions here. Nick Amantanagelo, did I get that right? Amantanagelo? Oh, yeah, got pretty close. All right, sorry, Nick. Uh, anyway, uh, a viewer has a family in an assisted living facility. While all the residents were tested for COVID, there weren't enough tests for everyone who works at the facility. The viewer is concerned because those workers are the ones who are going to go out into the community and potentially bring COVID back to the facility. They wanted to know if there's anything being done to increase testing in facilities like that. And again, I would certainly, the first thing I would do is encourage people to go out to that testnebraska.com. So again, if you're, you put that into that healthcare worker, we've got that feature turned on. So you will get, you can answer no, you don't have symptoms. Healthcare worker, you'll get scheduled to get tested. Charlie Brogan, KFOR. <clears throat> With the easing of the DHMs, is there an update to the advice for self-quarantining after travel. Is a person still expected to self-quarantine for a certain period of time after leaving the state for a short weekend trips to places like Council Bluffs, Des Moines, or Kansas City? So again, for people who are working, right, if you're, if you're, got those, you're doing those essential work kind of things, you know, you're, maybe you're a truck driver or something like that, you don't have to quarantine. 
But through the month of May, we are saying that if you are going someplace else where you might be potentially exposed to coronavirus when you come back, plan on quarantining for those two weeks. That's one of the ways that we're going to slow the spread of virus here in the state. So, you know, use your good judgment and common sense on this. Um, you know, if you're going to places where especially, you know, that they've got the spread of the virus, we want to make sure you're quarantined through the month of May. That's still in place. Martha Stoddard, Omaha World Herald. Uh, Governor Ricketts has said the state can provide aggregate numbers on coronavirus cases for meatpacking. Okay, we've done that already, 1,005. Dr. Ansone said he would get me aggregate numbers of cases among residents, cases among staff, and deaths of residents. So we covered that as well. So, uh, again, that's that 267 numbers for uh, residents of long-term care facilities, uh, 188 staff members, 57 deaths. And for breaking that out between the skilled nursing facilities and the assisted living, uh, Martha, we, I'll, Dr. Anton, can you just get back to Martha with regard to the breakout between those two? So we'll, we'll get that breakout, Martha. I'm sorry, you're right here, Martha. Um, <laughs> we'll get that breakout for you, and Dr. Anton will follow you, follow you up with that. So you've got the aggregate number. We'll get the breakout between those two. You're here. How come you're submitting the questions? <laughs> just get up front. Just get up front. Okay, you know I answer these first. Smart. All right, Matt uh, Olberding uh, from the Lincoln Journal Star. I was just curious as to whether the governor's comments yesterday about COVID-19 cases and meat plants were meant as guidance for local health departments. So yeah, again, so our guidance to local health departments is, you know, obviously you need to work with your local community, but our guidance is don't release facility information unless you've uh, gotten the facility to sign off on that and you've verified who actually works there because that is one of the problems we've been having problems with in the past. Does the governor feel the same way about similar information being released about other outbreak locations? I would say yes, that would be a good policy just in general. Uh, we like to release aggregate data, but not specific location data, especially when we have trouble, um, if you have trouble verifying it. So uh, for example, health districts have provided information to public uh, and the media about cases related to nursing homes. Again, same would same apply just, I said, for our food processing facilities. If you can't get back to me, oh, Governor's News Conference, I can serve, so we picked it up. So Matt, we picked it up in the question and answer here. Uh, J. Omar, K-O-L-N. I'm reaching out for a little clarification from the governor about local health departments, not to post data related to meat processing facilities across the state. I know some districts decided to do so after the governor's comments yesterday. Again, I would say follow the guidance we just said. Um, you know, work with the facility and make sure that you're verifying uh, the numbers if you're going to do it. Otherwise, we encourage just doing it in aggregate. Gavin Higgins, KCNI, there is possibly an individual in our area telling an employer that they tested positive for COVID-19, but is not true, but it's not true. That person then filed for unemployment. Is there a way for employers to check if the person took the test without health districts, uh, with health districts without violating HIPAA laws? So no, there isn't really a way for an employer to know. We kind of covered this a little bit yesterday when we talked about employers not knowing if somebody's tested because that... They can't know because of HIPAA laws. They can't inquire, and we can't tell them either. So with regard to that, there's not a way for us to, uh, there's not a way for an employer to know. So uh, what I would say, though, is, again, an employer, in the case of somebody who's testing positive for coronavirus, the employer should not be just firing that person. They should be putting that person on maybe, uh, you know, having them take their sick time. Maybe uh, I know some of the food processing facilities are actually doing short-term disability to be able to cover that gap there. So there's other ways to do it. Now, if the person quits, they're not eligible for unemployment. So you can't just quit and be eligible for unemployment. But if an employer does suspect that somebody has quit and, um, and was not fired and is maybe misrepresenting that, they should contact the Department of Labor to be able to get that clarified. And we'll follow up again. If, if you're, and if you're called back to work, again, if you're one of those at-risk people, say you're older, have that underlying health care condition, work your employer so you don't get called back. But if you are you know, not one of those at-risk people and you get called back to work and you do not go back, that is considered a quit and you will lose your unemployment benefits. Uh, Jerry Oster, WNAX. The Tax Foundation has a report out that shows Nebraska has enough unemployment reserve to pay 15 weeks of benefits at the current rate. Is that accurate? And where would the funding come from to extend those benefits? So uh, first of all, obviously, that rate is going to be variable based upon how many new claims you have and so forth and how fast we get more people going back into the workforce and all that. So um, it's tough to put actual number on that. However, one of the things the CARES Act does allow is for that CARES Act money to be able to go into the unemployment 
uh, relief fund so we can replenish those dollars with CARES Act dollars. So nobody needs to be concerned with regard to our ability to play unemployment. We have the CARES Act money to be able to do, do that. So, um, so I would say that uh, we're, in, we're in fine shape. People should not be concerned about our ability to pay unemployment. Taylor. So uh, with regard to kids returning to school in fall, actually, Commissioner, I'm going to have you come up. We've been working very collaboratively on this. So again, that's the way we've tried to approach all this, Joe, is to try and work collaboratively together. So to bring people in with regard to have discussions doesn't mean we always agree, but we do have those discussions. So but Commissioner, I'll have you come up and talk a little bit about this. Yeah, and I think in many ways the uh, ability to return to school is, is essentially to be continuously working with uh, uh, local public health where the conditions are. What we are somewhat fortunate, as I was trying to describe before, as we go into the summer, there is this chance to kind of look at the uh, processes and procedures and try to get to a point where those decisions can be made at a local level based on the conditions that are taking place at that local level in that moment. And so I think a big part of it for us is continuing to set up those protocols and be in a position where that, that data is clear. I do think there will be areas of the state that are able to keep pretty much their regular calendar intact, and I think that's what folks are interested in. But we are also asking schools to be very thoughtful in, uh, about digital and remote learning as we continue down that, that path. And I think, I think basically as we continue the conversations with administrators and local level leaders, that'll become clearer and clearer, but that's the intent of the Launch Nebraska site. Um, we certainly would hope that the, we'd see rate of infection declining at some point in this process, and I think all the, the conversations on that front, but I, I do believe that as we do that, it'll be watching things also at, very much at a local level, too. I mean, I, there are areas of the state, I get phone calls from superintendents and districts that say, hey, look, we don't have a case right now, where, you know, where are we going to be? We're going to have better and better data due to the test in Nebraska. By the way, I don't know if I like the test in Nebraska thing up here as the commissioner of education, because people think <laughs> of it differently. Um, not all people really love state testing, but in this case, it's a very good thing. But the, the reality for us is we're going to have better and better data as we go through the summer to be able to make really solid decisions. And also too. Yeah. yeah, so, and I think one of the other things, too, is we'll have data from other places. I think in South Korea, people are going back to school, Sweden, so there's other places we'll have to get some data. And the other thing, too, I just want to point out is that we got great leaders. Uh, you know, I, I just want to give a, again, Shout out to uh, Mark Shepard in Fremont. You know, he made the decision very quickly to go to spring break early. Dr. Logan, Dr. Ru uh, Dr. Joel uh, in Omaha and Lincoln, respectively. So we've got people who are thinking about this who are just great, intelligent leaders that are working with the commissioner. So I'm confident that working together, we'll be able to put together a plan for kids to come back to school in the fall. Michael from the Dakota County Star has, um, just wants to know, do you think that the processing plant should be releasing their own numbers to keep uh, on rates of positive tests to keep the community updated? I'm sorry, Michael. From the Dakota County Star. From the Dakota County Star says, do I think that uh, you know food processing plants should release their own numbers? That really is a decision for the company to make. And again, this is why it's really a local type decision to work with your local public health department. The thing that I'm most concerned about is we make sure that any data that is released is going to be accurate. So, but I think that's really a business decision whether or not the processors want to do that or not. Uh, Rob McCartney has a question for John Alban. Can you update people on the status of receiving unemployment and stimulus funds? Uh, he's been hearing from people who are still waiting. Rob McCartney wants uh, the Commissioner of Labor, John Alvin, to come up and talk a little bit about the unemployment program. He says people are still waiting, so Commissioner, can you come up and give us a little bit of update on where we are with regard to those benefits? Sure. Thank you, Governor. Um, okay, first of all, just a little bit back to last week's executive order. Uh, we moved uh, 22,000 new people into payment status this week. Uh, largely due to the executive order and not going back on all of those old claims. Um, so far, our indication, our records show that 81% of all claims have been filed since March 8th are processed and done. 70% uh, of those are paid. So um, 
that would be that number. Um, we do have some claims that are a little more difficult than others. A lot of them have involved uh, combined wages. Um, if we request, if an individual has worked in two states, they can file in either one of those two states. And until you get the full record, you're really not supposed to adjudicate their claim. And we have a lot of those uh, where we've not heard back from other states. I just worked, got two com uh, emails about them this morning. There were other states. Um, so we're doing some follow-up with those states to try and see if we can get that information. Um, so we have, uh, let's see if I can find my number here. We've processed $75.2 million in payments from regular unemployment benefits. We've got another $9.6 million paid out of uh, almost 13,000 uh, PUA claims. And then on top... Pandemic unemployment assistance, and then we've uh, paid out another 164 million in the uh, uh, federal pandemic unemployment compensation FPUC, the $600 a week uh, payment. So, um, you know, we have of all the claims that we've got, we've had, and the numbers a little bit inflated because you some of the PUA claims ended up counting twice because they were counted when they filed as regular unemployment, and then again as the PUA, but um, if you put all those numbers together, we've paid, uh, we've cleared about 94,000 claims since uh, uh, March 8th. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have a lot to go because there's about 26,000 left in the queue that we need to get working on and we are working on as we go through. Uh, but we've made substantial progress and yes, there are some uh, claims out there. Uh, if you look at the federal reports, which are a little bit skewed, I think uh, it says we're paying about 80% or 90% within uh, 28 days. Um, I think that's a little skewed because there's 4,258 claims that are left uh, from the March group. A lot of those are uh, special, uh, they have special circumstances that are delaying their payment. So, you know, I think we're getting a passing grade. Uh, we'd like to pay it faster. I'm sure those that are waiting would like uh, to be paid faster, but um, I think that's our numbers. Yeah, so I think if I could just follow up with that with Rob one thing, there may be good reasons why some people are not getting paid their claims if there's, as John was pointing out, problems with the claim or they've got claims in both states. There are, there are things we still have to follow in the law to be able to be able to process those. So some uh, reason may, there may be reasons why some claims are legitimately not being paid, but we're working to get all the ones that we can pay is done as quickly as possible. Andrew wants to know, do you have to have a driver's license or state ID to get tested at Test Nebraska? Do you have to have a, Andrew Rizaki wants to know, do you have to have a driver's license or a state ID to get tested at Test Nebraska? And Dr. Anton, do you happen to know the answer to that question? I know that we ask people to verify their identification, but I'm not sure the process for how we do that because, again, it's supposed to be for a specific person that you're getting, you know, that is signed up and, and approved. Oh, it's a QR code. So do you have to show the ID? No, you don't have to, so Taylor knows. I don't know why you asked me the question, so he knows the answer. Uh, no, you don't have to have, no, Andrew, you don't have to have an, an ID to be able to get tested. It's a QR code that you're assigned from the email. Um, Chris White here and Paul Hamill were both asking for comment on, um, someone from the Central Health District said today, uh, was speculating that there have been delays in getting test results back from Test Nebraska. Um, did you want to say something about that? So uh, Chris Wagner uh, and Paul Hamill were both asking about uh, delays on getting test results back from Test Nebraska. Well, again, we just started this on Monday. Our goal is to try and get these turned around in 48 hours, but it's a new process. So just like anything, the more you do something, the better you get at it. So I, we'd ask people's patience on this, that we are, you know, this is a new process for us too. So we are trying to get these turned around. I think we've been able to get back to about 540 of the 1,500 people or so that have been test tested so far, but, um, you know, obviously that could mean some people from the first day didn't get the responses back. But, um, again, we'll continue to track that and make sure that we're getting the system down so we get back to people as quickly as possible. And as always, I ask people, check your spam filters. Some, we have been getting noticed that sometimes these emails are getting caught in a spam filter. So whether you're doing, you get the email to go out, assessment, blah, 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 anything, always check your spam filter. If you think you should have gotten an email and you didn't. To you to close JVS and that you said no. Did you have anything you wanted to say? 
So Paul Hamill is also asking about a ProPublica uh, story that the Grand Island Public Health Department wanted to close JBS and that I said no. So let's go back in time. About a month ago, uh, there was a letter that was published in the Omaha World Herald on a Sunday where I think 45 doctors had requested that. That same day, we actually had a call scheduled with the public health director and some of these doctors, as well as the mayor of Grand Island, talking about this. And actually, I started off by the conversation talking about what we were doing to address some of the issues, the resources we're deploying, and so forth. And reminding them, because I think what they were actually asking for was a shelter in place order. I don't know that they specifically asked for a closure of JBS. I can't recall from what that article said. But I reminded them that even if there was a shelter in place, uh, order for Hall County, that that would not close JBS because JBS was determined to be an essential industry by the federal government. So what they were, if they were hoping to get JBS closed down, that was not going to work. So they never actually made an official request in that meeting. I kind of covered that ground ahead of time before we got into the questions and answers talking about what some of the implications of what they were asking for in that Sunday World Herald article were about. So again, if you were actually, we didn't do that here in the state, obviously, where we didn't do a, a shelter in place order. But in other states where you did do this, you had to go through and list all the businesses that were essential, ones that are not essential. We didn't do that here in Nebraska. But food processing would be one of those essential ones. The president's uh, executive order really kind of clarified and reemphasized that. So that would not have caused JBS to close down, uh, even if that was the intention that what some of the folks wanted. Um, William Conroy has two questions for Commissioner Bloomstead. Make sure you repeat the question. All right. I'll remember. Uh, he wants to know, will policy So the question basically is, is there going to be a uniform policy and approach to, to closure of schools? And I, I think in that particular question, the Launch Nebraska piece will actually allow for local decision making and the opportunity to explore what that looks like. So I think in that case, not uniform. The second question, uh, um, what happens if, if schools are essentially being requested to close or and going down that path? And again, the Launch Nebraska uh, website uh, starts to provide policies and procedures for schools to think about how they close down. They're going to have to be flexible in case that comes along, but we're really trying to make sure there's a bit of a education safety net in place relative to a school's ability to be flexible in that moment. I didn't catch who asked the question, so I don't know William if I... Padmore. William Padmore. William Padmore. All right, yeah. And, you know, one other thing I just tag on to the commissioner's question, uh, because William was also saying something about cases. Folks, as we test more, we're going to have more cases. Case, the case counts rising is not a good measure to look at, because we're going to test more. We're going to get more people testing positive. That's just the way it works. Think about the reverse. If we ended all testing, we get no new cases, right? Well, everybody knows that's not the right answer either, right? So we want to be able to test more, get those people to isolate. Now, one of the things we do use well, so a couple of reasons. We use the testing to be able to get pe find people who need to isolate, right, so they don't go and infect other people. And we use that to do our contact tracing so that we find other folks who have been in contact with that person who's tested positive, get them to quarantine and monitor their conditions, monitor their, you know, their uh, symptoms to make sure they're not going to test, you know, develop the sickness and get them tested if they start showing symptoms so that we can keep them isolated as well. Now, one of the other purposes that we use testing for is to look at percent positives. So if we look at a population and we see the number of percent positives going up like 30, 40 percent, then we know something's going on in that community and we know to be able to prioritize more resources for that community, more testing resources, more contact tracing, and so forth. Uh, we look to the healthcare system if we need to move patients to make room in the healthcare system to pro provide more accommodation for folks there. Those are other things we would use that testing for. But just case counts rising is not a very good indicator because as we test more, we're going to get more. Tia, KPTM wants to know how many hospital beds are available across the state right now. Well, as I said, I actually have Dr. Antone look find the exact number, but we have about 30, over 3,900 hospital beds, staffed hospital beds. We've got 48% capacity in hospital beds, 44% in ICU beds. Do you want to come up and give the specific numbers, Dr. Anto? Sure. I can't believe the governor's memory, but um, yeah, he was right on the mark. We have uh, 3,926 total staffed hospital beds in the state of Nebraska. Currently, 
48% of those beds are available, 44% of the ICU beds are available, and 77% of the ventilators throughout the state of Nebraska are available. For the state number, we have currently 164 COVID positive patients in the hospital. We have 22 COVID positive patients in ICU rooms. And we have 35 COVID positive patients um, in, in, on, um, on ventilators currently at this time in the state of Nebraska. So the um, best story I heard today is out of Grand Island, St. Francis Hospital. And that was a hospital that was probably the hardest hit hospital. When I visited there about two weeks ago, they had 14 patients on ventilators in the ICU. They currently are down to only five COVID positive patients in the ICU on ventilators. And uh, the CMO at that hospital told me today that well, throughout the whole month of May, seven days in May, they've only had nine COVID positive patients admitted to the hospital. Whereas some days during the month of April, they would have up to seven to eight patients admitted per day. So I thought that was uh, probably the best way to really explain what's going on. Same thing in Lexington area too right now. Very, very slow activity. Do they have enough ventilators there? Where's this at, Taylor? Lexington. Uh, Lexington. And um, the question is, is in Lexing Lexington Hospital, how many patients on ventilators in Lexington? Actually, Lexington does have the capacity to intubate and put a patient on a uh, ventilator for short term. But when that would happen in Lexington, we would transfer that patient out as soon as possible to an area hospital. They did, I think, have the capability for taking care of four ventilated patients at a time. Currently, they have not had any admissions any transfers, um, and their census has remained at five over the last three days. So again, very, very good situation in, in Lexington area. So thank you, Dr. Antone, and the answer is yes. We've had a conversation with the mayor as well as the public health director. Again, just talking about the resource, answering questions, talking about the resources uh, being deployed there with regard to additional testing. Uh, obviously, we've had the National Guard in the area. Uh, also, with the contact tracing, the teams we're standing up at the state have been deployed to be able to help out uh, Two Rivers Public Health Department to be able to do their contact tracing. So, again, what we've done is we've stood up these teams that talk about that. You know, we've got six teams stood up. We've got four more that are training this week. They'll be ready next week. We're deploying those to the areas where we have the highest percentage of test positive things, places like Lexington, Two Rivers Public Health Department, to be able to help them out up in you know, Dakota County as well. Uh, still doing it, you know, it's doing the work in Grand Island, Hall County. So uh, lots of resources, but really being dedicated to where we see the most cases. And then finally, Valerie um, wants to know if you have a decision coming on when youth sports can re resume. So Valerie is also asking about youth sports. This is a conversation we are having, so I would say, Valerie, just stay tuned, and we will have an announcement on that as we kind of work through the process. But uh, just so we're clear, nothing in May. No organized team sports in May. Not youth, not adult, nothing. Okay, so just we're clear. There's been some confusion on that. No organized team sports. So, okay, just for the month of May. Everybody's clear. All right, great. Questions from here? Fred. Governor, I'm on the So among the 1,005 food processing uh, positive cases we have, how many deaths we have? I don't have that answer right offhand. Dr. Anton, do you happen to have that? Not the specific number, but uh, outside of the assisted living and skilled nursing facility, we've had two deaths there. Okay. Uh, and we've had one death in the ICU and one death in the hospital. I don't know it's a lot fewer than work. nursing homes, I guess, is what Dr. Anton is saying. But we work on tracking yeah. that down for him, please? We'll get back to you on that, Fred. Have any of the staff, none, none, there's been no deaths among staff in the long-term care facilities, it's all been among residents. Lee. Question for Commissioner Bloomstead. You know, Commissioner. Kind of two questions here. You talk about um, looking forward to 
board. Can you kind of give us an update on looking back almost the educational past for the past two months, right? What has been lost? What have you learned? And what are you going to carry on to the summer and or the fall? So really the question is to kind of reflect on where we've been the last couple of months relative to the educational impacts and, and then what we've learned uh, as a result of that. Number one, I think it's really uh, uh, critical to understand that there is an impact, obviously, that the day-to-day -day impacts of uh, what happens in a school setting, we, we really approach uh, students with disabilities different when we're able to work with them in person, right? And that we're able to impact uh, students that maybe have other uh, learning needs that, that in, in in a physical presence are, are, I would say, easier to address those types of challenges. And so we've really tried to work with our various uh, partners, our disability advocates and others to try to come up with uh, solutions to the challenges that they may face. I'm very proud of our schools for efforts that they've had to get creative in, in ways to serve those particular students. But we are learning from that moment too and then understanding that all the better and thinking about digital resources that are more accessible for our students who are deaf and hard of hearing, our students that may be blind and visually impaired, our students that may have other uh, cogn cognitive uh, disabilities that we have to be able to help serve. And so that's that's been one lesson. And I think our lesson also in how we work with parents most effectively and how we do that particular work has been something. But it's also our thought about how we've learned in the general education spaces about what students really need um, to be supported. And there's a real need for social emotional learning in the sense that students need that, that contact, right? And so our teachers have done remarkable jobs of finding ways to reach students in, in a lot of different fashions, certainly anything from phone calls to what's happening in, in, in uh, digital learning environments to, to those connections. And, and continuing to do that work is going to be uh, critical. I really do believe that after this is all done, we'll be better for the digital environments, we'll be better for the connections with parents, we'll be better in the long run for how we really think about education differently. And I joked a little bit about the Test Nebraska piece up here, but we have to think about assessment differently, and we are going to have to learn what types of what types of uh, gaps might uh, number one persist as a result of the of this uh, uh, opportunity to learn that we that we lost but really we're gonna have to meet students where they're at and and continue to grow and make sure that they can accelerate their learning as we do return back to a, a more normal environment that was my other question that, that gap right obviously is evident amongst all all the grades can you talk about how you have seen that played an impact on students going to the the next grade and how you guys are going to address so, so the question is really about the uh, learning gaps that maybe have, have persisted and maybe existed before and how this moment in time we can actually uh, begin to move forward. Certainly summertime, by the way, is one of those places where we put a, a particular emphasis on literacy and the opportunity to really help students that might be otherwise struggling with uh, learning to read at our lower grade levels or, or having some other types of difficulties with, with their advancement in, the, in their coursework. Not every student learns at the same pace, right? And so for us in these moments is a chance really to learn how to support each and every student and track that progress. And I think that's that's going to be a chance for us to do that. Will there be a, additional kind of uh, lost learning opportunities and, uh, and the persistency of that gap? That's actually been a long-standing issue. And I actually think there might be some innovations that come out of these moments to better address that going forward. Good chance to have Commissioner Bloomstead another question. He's up there. Like, and Francis, I just want to say thank you very much. You're doing a great job. I get to take a break from talking when like, the commissioner comes up, especially when the commissioner comes up. <laughs> but you don't get that break. So thank you very much, Francis. You're doing a great job. All right, other questions? Martha. Um, given the, that uh, you have 1,005 1, cases out of the 6,771, that are uh, meatpacking or food processing workers, should the state have been doing more earlier to um, help those plants institute social distancing so that we didn't have these, these kinds of outbreaks? I mean, obviously, you've done some stuff since the outbreak started, but not. So the question was, should the state have done more with regard to our food processing facilities to be able to help prevent them? You know, you can, hindsight's always going to be 2020. Uh, it's called, yes, if I had known things two months ago that I know today, I would have done things differently. But that's called experience. 
course, you hoped you would learn from your experience to do a better job going forward in the future, and that's what we've done. So for example, let's take the case of Grand Island, which was really kind of our first hotspot. Um, we used that experience that we learned in Grand Island to be able to address Lexington so that we can move quickly with testing resources and uh, using our t contact tracing and moving people in hospitals. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Lexington Hospital is in as good a shape as Dr. Anton was just describing. So, but again, you know, this is something that we're all kind of learning through together for the first time. And we have put a, a system in place where for weeks now we've been having weekly calls with all of the food processors. UNMC has been out visiting these facilities. They visited, I think, uh, 12 or 13 of them now. They've published their, their handbook. It would have been nice to have all that two months ago before this all started. But again, that's again called experience. You, you learn how to do these things as you have these situations arise. We've never had a pandemic in Nebraska before, at least not in 100 years. So there really wasn't a playbook for us to be able to go to. We had to develop the playbook as we were learning along the way. What about the companies themselves? Should they have looked at the social distancing guidelines that you had put out and said, well, gee, this doesn't quite fit our situation here. Maybe we need to make some changes. So the question was, gee, what about the companies? Should they have looked at the social distancing guidelines and said they should make some changes? And I do think some of the companies were indeed doing that. Uh, again, it gets back to none of these companies have had to deal, deal with a pandemic in 100 years either. So again, I think going back and trying to Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback this is a little difficult because nobody has dealt with this in 100 years in our country. So we're all figuring out better ways to be able to address it. You know, education, same sort of deal. Uh, we're learning how to be able to address this. Uh, we're learning from our experience. We're doing a better job. You know, uh, there, there really wasn't anybody coming to us and saying, hey, you should be flagging this right here. It was when we started seeing the increase in case counts that we first started, you know, getting on, by doing testing, that we first started getting on to this, that we had to make changes. We have time for some more questions. Oh, I'm going to go back here. Yep. I know that we're aiming for 21 to 28 days for that payout, but as we get further along in these unemployment claims, is there a more realistic number for the amount of time it is for the average person to get that first? So the question was, I know we're shooting for 21 to 28 days, and is there a more realistic time frame? Again, we are working to get these turned around. I think that, as the commissioner was saying, we are catching up on some of these. How many did you say we processed in the last week since I signed the executive order? 22,000. So with signing that executive order last week, that has allowed us to be able to process these more quickly. And we want to get back to that goal of having, you know, 95% of these done within 21 to 28 days. 90%. 90% within 21 to 28 days. So we want to get back to that goal of having those 90% that 90 in 21 to 28 days. Fred. So the aggregate number, again, is kind of pulled from those local public health departments. That's where we get all of our information. So again, there's always, again, that's why I want to be cautious with those numbers is that that's self-reported data oftentimes and why we're encouraging public health districts, especially it's one thing to have an aggregate number because that will kind of hopefully wash out some of the mistakes that might be being made across individual companies. But when you want to get back to specific companies, that's where it's difficult to assign specific people to those without verifying with that company. So our data is coming from the local public health districts. It could, you know, it could be an error because we are requiring our self people to self-report. And that's one of the reasons why we want public health districts really to work to verify it. Last question. Last question. Martha. Um, why do you why are you giving private companies a veto over public health data? I mean, you're you're saying that the local health departments have to get permission. So the question is, why are we asking local public health departments to work with those companies? And it gets back to trying to verify the data and working in a collaborative way, just like we tried to work all along with everybody collaborative. You know, somebody was asking a question earlier about how are we going to make the decisions to, on schools? Well, it's going to be a collaborative process. We've been working trying to get people's input on this. Um, again, local public health directors will have the, you know, it's ultimately going to be their call what to do. But people ask for our guidance, so our guidance is verify with the company and really work with them to be able to release those numbers about a specific facility. Not an aggregate facility, not the aggregate numbers, but the specific facility. We want to make this a collaborative process. So that's, that's our guidance. Now again, the local public health directors are going to be 
uh, making their own decisions, but people ask us for guidance, that's the guidance we gave. Well, again, folks, thank you very much. Appreciate everybody coming here to talk about what we're doing here at the state to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. We will be back here again tomorrow at 2 p.m. to do the English briefing, 2 p.m. Central Time. We'll be back here tonight at 5 p.m. Central Time to do the Spanish language briefing. I'll be on an NET at 8.30 tonight on the Speaking of Nebraska program, so you can also catch up there. We'll be answering other questions as well from the folks there. I want to say thank you to all the Nebraskans who are working to be able to slow the spread of coronavirus here in our state. I appreciate all your efforts. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your sacrifice. Another way you can help fight the spread of the virus here in the state is to go to testnebraska.com and get signed up to do one of those assessments. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you back here again tomorrow. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dr. Antone. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Thank you, Francis.